Welcome to session four of the pre-accelerated program for the Termist Business Plan Competition. Today we have McKenna Roberts speaking, who was our ch guest chair for the last session, um, but is actually a very experienced individual in her own right, so we're very lucky to have her today. Um, we're going to start off just by going over quickly the uh, business plan competition, because that's the reason that we're all here, really. So this is the session four of the pre-accelerated program, as I said, um, kindly sponsored by Imogel, Protip Medical and Regen MedNet, who have made this possible. Today, we're going to just start off by introducing the business plan competition again. Well, not introducing, but going over the key dates. And uh, we're going to have McKenna speaking um, for probably about 40 minutes or so about uh, some of the IP strategy in tissue engineering and regenerative medicine, which is the focus of today's session. Then we'll close off uh, with a Q&A session. So the applications are now open for the business plan competition for the first round. Um, the submission deadline is actually the 17th of February, um, not January. So we've extended a little bit just to give you guys a little bit more time um, to get those together. Now, the business plan competition is a pretty fantastic opportunity for young entrepreneurs or even just academics who have a commercial interest who are working in the tissue engineering and regenerative medicine field. It's the largest accelerator program in Europe in this industry. Um, and covers an all sorts of different elements of tissue engineering and regenerative medicine, including diagnostics, manufacturing, uh, delivery of medications. It could be all sorts of different things within the industry. And what we try to do through this competition is give early career researchers the opportunity to just think about the commercial implications and potential of the research that they've been doing. So last year, most of the applicants were probably PhD students or postdocs. Um, I actually entered last year as the only master's student as well, so there are, there's a range of different um, experience levels. But uniquely, everybody is fairly young and um, fairly early in their career stage. So the aim of this competition is to be accessible to that kind of demographic and to really encourage those people to think about how they might commercialize their, their, pro their platforms. So I spoke a little about the accessibility element of it. I think this is a really important thing for people to acknowledge. It can be a little bit intimidating thinking about going to Davos and presenting your, your final pitch to uh, lots of hundreds of people. But actually, we have a program of training and mentorship uh, throughout that and before you reach that stage that will prepare you not only to uh, be confident in translating and communicating your business to uh, potential investors, but to really enhance the quality of your business plan. And it's through mentorship and the training program that we run through the Pre-Accelerator program that we're able to uh, really help you to develop your, your ideas. Crucially, we'll have two mentors per team. You have an academic mentor that can help you with the technical side of your plan, and we'll have a mentor with some great industrial experience who'll be able to help you with your business strategy um, and to help you write your plan. As well as that, the training program through webinars, uh, throughout our series of webinars, we'll, we hope to address most of the uh, important elements of your, of your business plan. And if you listen to what is being said and you apply the information that's being uh, translated through these webinars, you'll be able to enhance the quality of your business plan. Then when we actually get there and we get to the competition, uh, you'll have some amazing networking opportunities uh, not only through the mentors that you're assigned to, but when you give your presentations right at the end, uh, there'll be hundreds of people watching. And from previous experience, that's really, really been a fantastic and powerful professional exposure opportunity. You'll be within the conference for three days as well. Uh, so you'll have all the time in the world to go ahead and introduce yourself to people. So the round one preparation um, is fairly straightforward. You, you just go to our website, uh, we'll have all the we have all the information about the business plan on there. There's a very simple online application form that you need to fill in just for the round one. Um, as I say, accessibility is a key theme in this business plan competition. So our first round is really designed to be as user friendly as, and as approachable as possible. It just requires, you don't need to do a full business plan at all, but you do need to have a really cohesive think about about what you will put into the details of your business plan when you go ahead and write it in the second round. 
So as I say, there's a simple online application. You don't need to submit it. You can go through and look at what you need to put in. You can write all of the content of it in Word, copy it over. There's a save to finish later function on the website as well. So you can start working on it, save it for later, come back to it. It's very straightforward. As I said, the deadline for that is the 17th of February. On the 17th of March, a month later, we'll announce who's made it into the second round. At the point of the second round, we'll ask each team to submit a full business plan. Uh, this is about 10 page business plan, which you will have until the 14th of April to do. So you'll have about another four weeks. In May, we'll announce who's made it into the finals. And then on the 16th of June will be the final deadline for the submission of the slide deck you'll use in the finals. The finals will be on the 30th of June in Davos in Switzerland, which is where the World Economic Forum is currently going on. Super interesting if you've got the time to listen to some of the talks there. It's a big, big conference center, um, and you will have the opportunity to spend the duration of that conference networking with people, being exposed to the talks and the interesting stuff that are going on in that conference, as well as giving your presentation the final round at the end of the conference. So without further ado, we will move on to our guest speaker for today. McKenna Roberts is a very experienced legal consultant in the life sciences sector. She does consultancy for various different legal firms um, and is a qualified lawyer. Her interests span IP technology, um, IP with technology and privacy, data protection, confidentiality, um, with a special interest in bioethics, regulation of emerging technologies, and all sorts of different things that are uh, interesting in emerging biotechnologies. So tissue engineering and regenerative medicine, clearly a substantial um, element of that. And we're, she's here today to talk about uh, tissue engineering, regenerative medicine, intellectual property strategies. McKenna is next to me, and we are up in the 28th floor of the Guys Hospital Tower. So I'm just going to I'm going to do a primer on intellectual property for the basics, and so that you have the tools and what you really need to keep an eye out for, and highlight some issues and pitfalls and suggestions. Um, that really is to pull together as a startup healthcare company the IP toolkit you need to have to hand from the very get go, and then I'm going to discuss different types of protection strategies that might be suitable for your business and your, your product, whether it be a therapy or device. And then I'm going to talk about the changing IP landscape that is distinct to term products. So very quickly, in, in defining what is intellectual property, it includes several different types of assets and, and rights, and those that you will see when dealing with your business, basically. Most common you'll see are things like trademarks, dealing with your branding, your logo, and of course, the all-important patent in the life sciences. Um, you also be, one thing that you'll come across a lot in biotechnology is know-how because it's critical to your business as well. So that's confidential know-how that, that helps you improve what you do and what you provide as a therapy better than your competitors. And I'm going to focus primarily today on the patent because it is so important to your business and, um, and kind of run you through the issues there, but I will touch upon the importance of the other areas of IP as they come up. So. One thing about intellectual property is, it, at the beginning, with a startup, it certainly feels expensive. And you're wanting to cut corners, and you're going to ask, if you really need this right now, how long can you delay actually investing and worrying about this? Maybe you want to get proof of concept first, all those kinds of things. And all I, can, I cannot emphasize enough, really, that it's important to think about it from day one. It is the fundamental basis of your business, and you won't have a business to be invested into. And anyone who watches Dragon's Gen will have watched this happen multiple times. And that's one of the first questions they have for an invention is, do you own the rights to it? And if you are not able to literally produce a copy of the patent rights or a license agreement, they really, they, they're not willing to invest because there isn't a business in their eyes to invest in. I think I just recently saw someone who had waterproof some clothing. And he stood up and said, well, I, yes, I have exclusive rights to this. And they said, really? He said, and he said, you know, so you have it patented. He said, well, I don't, but the person who developed it does. And I said, wait a minute, so you don't actually own anything. And he said, no, but I, I have exclusive distribution. I, was, I, I have exclusive rights to, to sell it. And he said, well, how do you know it's exclusive? And they actually made him produce the agreement, which wasn't a license agreement at all. It was a very shoddy distribution agreement. And all of the, the dragons backed out, with the exception of one who said only if 
that was sorted and with proper lawyers. And he had just had a friend kind of go through it and had drafted himself from the internet. Don't go that direction. It's a guaranteed miss, especially in a complicated world of biotechnology. So it, IP is also a source of revenue for you. It's something that you can use as collateral for securitizing other types of assets. You'll be able to license it. It will be absolutely tantamount to your business going forward. I should also mention very quickly that in the UK there are tax incentives and often comparable ones in other jurisdictions to encourage the innovation. The next two slides are really just for your reference. They are listing the different authorities where you can find um, four different types of IP. And I'm not going to go through and list those, but you're very happy to look through it if you're interested in any particular type of, of um, intellectual property right and where to look for the primary source. Now, to start off very quickly with patents and just a very basic introduction, it's often referred to as a monopoly right. Patents really are an exchange. You, give, you disclose information about your invention to the government in exchange for the government disclosing that as a public record, and you receive a fixed term monopoly right to it, which means you are the only exclusive rights to this invention. Now, it's not a positive right. You aren't entitled to anything to exploit, to exploit it or profit. You're, you're entitled to the right to protect it. So you can stop. It's a negative right. You can stop others and by actively enforcing your right. So you can stop competitors from using your same invention. An important concept to keep in mind throughout whenever considering intellectual property is even if you have a, a granted patent or a portfolio of patents, any one of those patents, even once granted, can still be challenged later on. And it could be found invalid. So it's not an invulnerable patent right. So what does it take to get a patent? There are five general qualities or requirements that you must have in all jurisdictions generally. And that's it must be permissible subject matter. So that the invention must fall into a patent eligible category of items. And so in, let's say in Europe, that is set out by statute. What, and there's exclusions for certain types of inventions that may not be patented. In, this, in the US, by, by a contrary example, they actually rely on judicial opinion for what they will exclude as non-patentable subject matter. You, the, most importantly, the invention must be novel which means it must not already be known to others. So it must not have been disclosed to the public. It must be non-obvious, and that means the invention must involve an inventive step. And my slide has a few pictures there, so it's just proposing that if everyone were to cycle around London, let's say, where I am, on square, square wheels, or frankly, if anyone were to cycle anywhere in the world, and they only have square wheels, someone comes along and they, they round out the edges, and they turn those wheels into round wheels, that becomes their invention. It's a round wheel cycle. If someone comes along and puts round wheels on cars, the question of whether that's in actually inventive, a novel step or not, or obvious, because it's just simply another type of locomotive, is one that would have to be debated in granting that patent. Arguably, it's probably quite obvious. So that the non-obvious step is usually where a lot of time is spent. Um, and in the US, the patent must be useful which is broadly interpreted. And in Europe, it must have industrial application. And finally, the inventor must disclose enough information about the invention for, to enable someone, a person skilled in the field to duplicate the experiment. So that's, that's the enablement requirement. And it's those five requirements that let you actually claim intellectual property. And what I have here in my next slide is just to give you a taste of how this really plays out in the real world by a couple different scenarios. So because people are claiming patent proprietary rights or patent rights to various types of invention that often are, inter are interlapping with each other, they're, they're in exchange, so they, it can be mutual components of the same invention, it can be quite um, confusing. And so by way of example, if you have A, patents and invention, and then B comes along, and B improves by using a new material that's perhaps, let's say, lighter. Or in this case, uses a, a different cell type as a starting material for biotech purposes. B is able to patent the, the use of the new material in, for A's invention. But B has an issue in actually being able to use it and, and obtain profits, because B relies on A's design or A's device in order to, to put in his new material. Now, B has the ability to use the new material in other ways. 
So if it were, let's say, using a, a, a bamboo lighter material for a bicycle frame, we can use bamboo for other things. But if, if it wants to, to actually manufacture A's bicycles using bamboo, B needs to, to get a license in order to have the right to use those, that patent and, and actually manufacture it. An alternative would be for A to go and actually either purchase or license from B the technology. But B has some flexibility and freedom to operate in other ways. The real problem comes when you have C coming along, and C decides to, let's say, improve the gear system or a delivery system for a particular medicine. And what happens is C is operating directly in the patented area of A's invention. C really can't do anything without permission from A. So C has a freedom to operate problem. And unless there is a supply agreement or some kind of licensing agreement struck, C's re C is not going to be able to profit from its invention. So that introduces me to, <laughs> takes us to the next point, which is one that I commonly see confused by clients all the time. And that's the distinguishment between patentability versus infringement. And I want to try and set this out as clearly as I can because it actually directly impacts on your business plan and how you devise it. So patentability occurs at the beginning stages of when you're trying to get a patent. You're going through what's called the prosecution process to have your patent um, granted or declined. And in, as far as this, this really focuses on the question, if you're asking yourself, can I patent my invention? You're talking about a patentability question. And in the world of biotech, this is actually um, the subject matter, whether you can or cannot patent certain inventions is, is actually a little bit in flux both on, in both the U.S. and in Europe at the moment. So there's certain questions that legally have come along. Whereas in most, when you're dealing with, let's say, small molecule drugs, what you can and cannot patent is usually fairly straightforward. Um, and, but in, in looking at this, what you're looking to see is what prior art exists. And that's what we refer to any, if anyone else has actually um, invented what you've invented or something similar to it. And that they're going to reference that prior art. And that's what you're going to find out in determining whether your invention is not obvious. You're next going to move to things of questioning whether the validity or expiry um, period, is, whether that is going to matter. Let's say someone has invented your invention, but that, that patent's expired. That is not going to matter. By the mere fact that someone has actually already put out to the public your invention in any shape and form, it doesn't have to be patented. It can be in a magazine article. It can be actually just seeing a, a prototype. It can be a lecture. In any form, if your invention has entered into the public consciousness, then it will be deemed prior art, and it can destroy the patentability of your invention. And it doesn't matter where in the world that takes place. And it doesn't matter whether those rights are valid any longer or not. It's whether they were if it's ever that no no invention can ever be patented twice is the concept. So on that slide, I have a, I have a rather lengthy example I'm not going to go into, but effectively says that if in a dusty shelf in Tibet, someone has published in their Tibetan equivalent of a Hello magazine, your invention, and no one's ever checked it out or known about it, and, and a competitor comes along and finds this, they can use that to challenge your patent, whether it's been granted or not, and actually deem it invalid or prevent it from the application from succeeding. So the second concept that I mentioned is infringement. And this often gets, gets muddled in with patentability, but actually it comes later in the process. And infringement is when you often will hear terms like freedom to operate, um, FTO opinions, and that sort. And for freedom to operate, you're wanting to know whether your invention has already been invented and claimed within the jurisdictions, your target markets, where you intend to actually operate. And you want to know, is there anything similar? So it's almost more like a competitive intelligence. If you're asking questions like, are there any therapies, devices, or inventions out there similar to mine? And if so, do those, can those patent holders possibly prevent me from running my business? Then you're talking about an infringement or freedom to operate issue. And, and, this is, and intellectual property and landscaping the patents in a technology is incredibly helpful for competitive intelligence. And not only just for knowing what your competitors are moving into and knowing what they're developing, but also to be able to see who you should maybe strategically partner with, where you can see certain companies going off in different directions as they look at different technologies that are related to yours, that kind of thing. So looking and doing your due diligence and actually researching who owns what within your technology area and field 
is very, very important for your business plan and knowing what's really going on there. And if you don't, you can make a detrimental mistake. And it turns out that actually someone's already doing what you're doing and may have a much stronger and established company so that they can actually block you. And, and, if, and you need to be able to act, work with them in order to come to some freedom to operate licensing agreement. And in intellectual property rights, the ability to negotiate and around all these issues is, is really that there's a variety of different kinds of agreements you can come to to deal with that. But that deals with the IP management and licensing aspects. So in this case, unlike with, with patentability, jurisdiction matters. Because if someone has invented what you, what you have, but they're, let's say, in Thailand, and you have no intention of really ever distributing or manufacturing your goods in Thailand, then that jurisdiction, then that, those rights can't be exercised against you as you, let's say, exercise them for, say, in the UK. And validity, of course, matters because if those rights have expired, then there's no rights for them to actually be able to, to exercise against you. So if it's past its 20-year mark. Just to give you a quick illustration, I have, have here when someone has invented the common chair. So you have a flat seating device with, on top of four posts. Someone comes along and they add arms to it so to, to, for you to be able to rest your arms. And that's their inventive step. The chair has been around for a while, and then someone says, you know what, I really want to rock in it. How can I get it to do that? And they invent a rocking chair. And they go off and they think, I am brilliant for having done this. I'm going to go patent my rocking chair. And they claim the entire rocking chair. The only inventive step that they're going to find after they look at the prior art is actually the curved, the curved base on it to let it rock. Whereas the arms, the seating device with the four posts, the back, all of that has, is infringing. And so often, we, patents often claim infringing claims of other patents. And those will be dropped away during the prosecution process of whether to grant the patent or not. So what you apply with, the claims you, that, you, that you have in your patent application, will be narrowed down upon grant to whatever is truly an inventive, non-obvious step. Now, I talked a little bit about searching, and I was saying how important it can be for your business and competitive intelligence. In general, as a basic due diligence, I suggest everyone do from the beginning, even if you're so sure you know your field and that you don't think anyone else out there is doing this. It's always good. It's public rec patents are a public record. They're open for everyone to be able to search, and there's a couple of very basic, easy search engines to use. It's now. If it's not guaranteed that you're obviously going to find everything, you're not a, an expert who's trained to study prior art, but to at least do some basic due diligence so you don't look foolish when you go to pitch your, your business plan is very important. It also helps you know how crowded similar inventions um, and how quickly you need to perhaps claim proprietary rights in your invention. So if it's a very crowded hot space like immunotherapies or stem cell research, people are more likely to claim earlier on, despite there being such a long timeline where they'd rather claim later so that they would have more proprietary rights exercise once their product reaches the market. So that timeline of when you claim um, um, proprietary rights really is determined by your competition in part, the life cycle of, of your research and development, your business focus, and so forth. Whether you're doing a platform technology that you're gonna license out, or one that you're gonna develop all the way to end. These are the things that searching to see what everyone else is doing and who owns what is incredibly important. And it will impress for your business plan pitch as well. Now I'm going to discuss about how to spot IP value and maximize it. It's not something that you necessarily can do. My, my great suggestion here is that everyone should do a brainstorming session from the get-go. And I highly recommend that that's a full top-to-bottom management brainstorm session with everyone in the room to just to pitch in and see where they each person thinks the value in the company, the business, the direction it might go, and the intention at that time and where and other and other thoughts. So you can try and identify value, hopefully, that you may not have recognized initially because inevitably there is IP value that you are not seeing. Most people go straight to the direct. They often think product, patent, either be device or the therapy itself. And really there is a raft of very lucrative IP to, um, that you could either own, license, and maximize for revenue reasons um, along that, that whole manufacturing production processes, all the stages involved, the cultures, everything that, each step of the way. And also there has to be a decision on what you really want to patent, which is a more expensive process but is the strongest of the IP rights, versus what you're going to hold back as either a trade secret or what you might use as confidential know-how. So. To give an example, 
of how IP is not always obvious where the value is. I have a very common hemodialysis ma machine, a picture there, and it treats blood through an advanced filtration process. It's a fancy machine, and you th in hospitals, you know, pay a lot of money to have these. And you think, how much do you would you estimate would be the patent, um, the value of the patent on the machine? And then look at some aspect of it, like the disposable plastic bags on the bottom of it. How how much would the would the patent for those disposable bags be? You know, where 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 else might be some IP value? Well. It turns out that the machine itself actually has no profit margin for the medical device company. And actually, because the plastic bags have to be changed each time for sterility, the filter and disposal system holds much more value. So it's $75,000, it's US dollars per machine per year. So 75% of the profit is actually coming from selling those disposable bags. And when you look at the numbers, it, it, over a course of a year, for each machine, it's costing 56250 If you do the math and you're installing 5,000 bags on the base of it, all of a sudden you're dealing with $281 million per year. So what really is the value of the patent on that hemodialysis fancy machine? And now think about what the value of the patents on the disposable bags, the plastic bags hanging from it. And you'll start to see that sometimes the IP value is not where you think it is. You really have to think through the processes involved. And in this case, a 5% royalty is $14 million per year. So that's not a bad deal. Now, in general, in dealing with biotechnologies, it tends to be, and this is a huge generalization, that IP value is often in the process and not the final product or therapy. So there's a lot to be had in the cultures and in all the, in the, the several complex stages in actually developing that therapy and administering it. Um, so that's... That's one thing to keep in mind. And another thing to say is obviously the, the, the R&D life cycle and timeline of this product development is so much longer than, let's say, a, a, a small molecule drug, which isn't small, which isn't short, but this is because of the regulatory and legal uncertainties often associated with these types of biomaterials and claiming patents in them. There is, there's a greater risk and a greater timeline, higher value, often large-scale trials. So it takes a long time. So you're going to have to think about what your business focus is. Is it on the manufacturing? Is it on the therapy, the, the end product? And what are all the different aspects along the way? And you're going to try and claim, try and figure out from the life cycle of your patent of 20 years, which can be extended, I'll discuss in a minute, there is, you're going to try and figure out, you want to really claim as late as possible so that you can get as much protection once your therapy is actually a product on market. Um, so, and, and, but then again, you can't hold off too long because someone else could, could develop the prior art and beat you to it and suddenly you aren't able to patent it at all. So it's a careful balance between the two. And that's why you really need to know your area and do your competitor intelligence and, and see what's happening in your field. So by way of example, I've just listed um, a, a few, several of the areas in, let's say, the stem cell area that all could attract very valuable intellectual property patents. And it goes everything from the expansion process of the cells, to cell culturing, storage, the characterization processes, every bit of every one of those stages actually attracts intellectual property. It which also makes it potentially very difficult for freedom to operate questions as well. So you need clarity on the ownership of who owns what at, when you develop these therapies and you actually want to offer one, a therapy. If your company is going to be offering a service, it's going to be offering a product of any sort in the biotech realm, they're going to be able to, they have to show that they have freedom to, to use each of the, each of the, um, the materials and, and processes along the way. So that's just a, this is just a very basic slide for your reference on the timeline for a patent. And from when you start from the priority date to your filing date 12 months later, and then you, if the patent is not published until 18 months after filing. So you then can have the examination report that you're seeing there, the request for an international examination, which is optional. That basically is allowing a, a search over for prior art, and that's done by the patent authorities. And I'm going to move swiftly on, because that's roughly for 20, you have your 20-year your, your patent period which can be extended in, in certain circumstances. And in biotech, it's quite important. So in the US, you have what's called patent term extensions. And in Europe, you have supplementary protection certificates, SBCs. And SBCs in Europe are for a maximum of five years. 
And these are these extensions are intended for when there are regulatory delays. So it takes so long for your product to make it to market, and the patent authorities recognize that. They're trying to compensate and give you a little bit more length of your patent later on. This can be extended for up to six months, again, in very um, specific circumstances for pediatric extensions. So I added a six months. So, all, so you could have, the maximum you could have really is 25 and a half years there. But that's unlikely. Usually it's not five years that you're going to get an SBC or, or patent term extension. Now, the mo one of the most important things you can focus on as far as intellectual property and that you will be asked about inevitably as a, in doing a healthcare startup is ownership of your IP. And it's the one area where time and time again I see clients just get it wrong. And they, they're very confident about who owns it. They think, they, you know, think it's very clear, and it's almost never a clear picture. And that's because there needs to be a very detailed paper trail for ownership in order to evidence that that's the case. Because the liabilities, if, if that's not the case, and who has rights to that invention, it then goes into question, could jeopardize the entire business. So in this case, you have your inventor, who may be working as an employee of the employer, or maybe a contractor who's just contracted in to, to develop something. Um, there may be assignments in their assigning rights here and there in writing, and there may even have been paid employee compensation at some point. And those are the kinds of things you need to keep in mind, because the founders of companies and biotech startups often have this core IP that they valued at the beginning that they base their business on, and they never bother to formally assign it to the company itself. It's still in their name. Things that's simple to remedy, it just has to be remedied. And, and there's many other issues where you have people who are collaborating and coming in at different stages in a very long pipelines and development processes. And what happens is if there's not a very clear paper trail when someone comes, what, who's contributed what, at what stage, on what date, and very detailed in what's called a due diligence Bible. If that's not started from the get-go, because of the assumption that it's all very clear in your particular circumstances. At some point, you're going to look at either selling, exiting your company, or you're going to have someone come in and want to have an acquisition, you're, or, or, or just investment. And they're going to want assurance that you own what you say you own, and that no one else can claim rights to it either or complicate the situation and cause expensive litigation. And unless you have a due diligence Bible started from the beginning, what ends up happening is you have to disentangle it all retrospectively. And at that point, it gets messy and expensive and time-consuming. So it is so much more impressive if you're able to say, well, we have been very careful from the beginning. We have kept a paper trail every date um, of what we're doing. So the, beyond that, I think that the one of the things I would, I would also that tend to crop up that I would warn against are just being aware that university publications, often if ac academia and industry are collaborating, and you have some kind of blended funding mechanism and so forth, there's a real pressure to publish. What you publish, the amount of detail you publish, um, is, is what you need to be very careful about. And there does need to be very clear consideration for the confidentiality, what information is being held confidential. And knowing that the timing is important, it's not that, that that information cannot be published, but it will have to be timed so that, let's say, if there's a patent application that's intended, that that happens before there is any kind of, um, that, that's filed and lodged before the, any kind of a publication. Now there are ways to remedy this in certain jurisdictions for certain kinds of grace periods, but it's, it's, it's absolutely critical and time and time again, tragically, uh, in this case where great academic spin-outs have been stopped very early in their tracks simply because it turns out there had been a disclosure and it, and it's, it becomes discovered whether by a competitor or just so happens, and the next thing you know, that they're no longer able to actually ha claim proprietary rights and what they're trying to develop, and there's no longer a viable business in the same way. And so that healthcare product and therapy really languishes, which is a shame for, for both public health and business in, in there. Uh, I also threw in really quickly to add that friends quickly become enemies when intellectual property becomes valuable. And this is particularly true with biotech, where you can see astronomical increases in profits very quickly sometimes. It's so much better to actually pay off early and secure the IP and, con and consolidate it early on, even when you don't know its value then. It may not be worth much, and it may not be developed fully, but it's worth it to actually have the clarity in case this actually goes on to be something that's, that, that has legs. 
And be very, very careful and mindful of using contractors and subcontractors when you're developing aspects of your, of your therapies. It, there must be clear agreements in place, and you will have to produce those. And if they're not there, it, that will be an issue that will be time and money for you to, to resolve before any investment or acquisition will go forward. Now, jointly owned IP, we, it, it all sounds very, very lovely and nice, but it's not something that's recommended. It definitely muddies the waters a bit. There's a big question of you know who whose obligations, who manages the patents, who's going to claim the scope, who's going to pay for the IP filing, and then who's going to pay the maintenance fees, which increase in 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 sum each year, or over the years, I should say. It's periodic in the U.S. Both parties have the right to practice um, the invention when it's jointly owned, and that means they have equal right to license it freely to others, and that that's. So unless you have those ends tied, no one's going to actually want to, to join business with you on, with joint ownership IP. Now, today's world, we have institutional stakeholders. We have blended funding mechanisms. There's a lot of collaboration. And all of those need to be very clearly drafted to address IP that's brought to the table, IP that's contributed, and who's going to own what when they walk away from it, and, and what's going to happen for any patent that is jointly claimed. It has to be thought out and thought about at the outset. So, a couple of just key patent facts that I, that I wanted to, to make sure that I hammer home is to think about IP from the get-go. You want to actually look at your business plan and you want to map your IP projections and, and investment, your budget, to the product pipeline. You want to make sure that they are, you're focusing on the right things, that you've got all the value you could, that you're not missing out on potential revenue streams along the way. But the other thing is, so often in business, because let's say clinical trial results dictate it, because the research grant changes direction, for whatever reason, your business may change direction. And oftentimes the IP strategy isn't revisited and it isn't changed accordingly. And so, and there's, there's loss of, of profit as a result. And in a, a budget that often could have been reduced or, or, or more um, efficiently spent. So, to give you an idea of costs, um, obviously, the more countries, the more significantly expensive intellectual property becomes. And uh, we've given a ballpark range kind of there, but it very much depends on what you're dealing with. But to give an idea, you know, if you have five countries that you're selecting to protect your, your, your patent in, you're looking at over 90,000 um, pounds over a five-year period. So to give you a basic idea. Another thing that you need to keep in mind as you are looking to see if your own due diligence and just seeing whether your business has legs and getting it started and making sure you're doing your competitive intelligence for, for your market um, is to know the difference between an A spec and a B spec. And this is a generalization, but generally speaking, patent applications and granted patents look very similar. But in actual fact, um, patent applications will have an A after their number and their specifications will, or what they've claimed tend to be broader than what actually will be granted. So it's not an accurate reflection of the rights actually th that are owned um, in the granted patent that results. So it's very important that if you're looking at applications, you know it's probably broader um, to keep that in mind and know it's an application. And also to ideally, if, when I'm to check and see if there's a granted patent version, a B version, a B specification of that a patent online. And if there's a granted patent, look to that patent document instead, because that will, that will re reflect what's actually owned in that case, what's being claimed. Uh, and then even granted patents can be challenged, which I've mentioned, and that's something to never lose sight of. And I, I just can't emphasize that enough, because it's, it's a nasty realization when, it, when suddenly later you're, you're liable. And just to give an idea of how many patents, one in three of all patent applications have already been patented. So one in three of the solutions out there have already been done, found. Um, and important aspects of that. So it's just to emphasize how important it is that you look to see what's really going on and when you search around. And be aware that renewal fees increase, it's something that's not often mentioned over the years. I mean, for the US it's periodic, for others it's, it's, year, it's yearly. So you actually, in different jurisdictions, want to make sure you stagger um, you, when you have multiple patents going along. You don't want all of your patents to suddenly have their renewal fees due roughly around the same date, because that's going to deeply impact your budget. That's the kind of timeline life cycles and IP strategy that you need to keep in mind. Um, lapsed patents can be revived for 12 months in Europe and up to two years in the U.S. if you've decided not to renew. So there's, there's a little bit of, of grace period. Um, and, and that also means that if you think a patent is, has expired, so it's not a threat to your business, 
that you're like, oh, I do have freedom to operate. You need to be very, look very closely at it and make sure that you're well out of that 12 month period in, in Europe or a two year period in the US. Because um, that is it, that, it, that is actually a very dangerous mistake that many businesses have made. Um, and always keep in mind that if you've left an inventor off, that could cost you your patent. Because um, especially in the US, this is particularly important. In inventors must be correctly named or it will invalidate the patent. And an inventor has the ability, it should have a contributed at least one claimed feature in your patent. So very quickly going on to the broader picture. That gave you the backdrop of the nitty gritty patent basics and intellectual property basics. But now we're looking at the broader scope of IP strategy for your business and what you need to do. There's so many different considerations that are so absolutely dependent and tailored to what it is you're trying to achieve and what's involved. But you can look at things such as whether you want to only kind of, let's say for budget reasons, to be defensive. So you want to claim the IP so that you can have the investment and so forth, but you're only going to exercise it against someone who happens to infringe and be a direct competitor in your field. On, on the flip side, you could choose to, that you actually want to build your portfolio and you want to aggressively acquire intellectual property along your pipeline, so both in the manufacturing and other processes related to your therapy. Um, that way, you can control your licensing fees and so forth. There's that. There's, it's all about what what kind of IP strategy you want to you think matches both financially, but also for for your business goals and helping you achieve them. If you really want to aim for, you say, oh, I want. I'm going to develop this therapy. We're going to get it through trials, and I want once it's once we've we've got it to a certain stage where we have good trial evidence. I'd like to. We'd like to exit. And we want to have the highest exit value possible. If that's the strategy, then you're really actually going to want to make sure you've maximized on your IP and, and acquired as much proprietary rights in the process to your therapy as you can, because that will increase your value. Things like that. So try to identify it, match your IPs to your, to your budget, and whether you're going to be aggressive or not. Do you actually, when you're later on and successful, do you want to keep other competitors out of the space as much as possible? And so you actually would rather go around and buy and act, buy, actually buy up the patents, the rights to other to other similar inventions in the area. You can either then then you have the control to license or not license it. Those are, that's a more offensive strategy. Now, it's really important in the biotechnology world to not overly focus on the patent, which is the tendency certainly of, of biopharma and, and, and pharma, pharma in general, because the patent is the focus for value often in the business world and investment world. So. Now with the development of medical technologies, what we're really seeing is that because of the uncertainty and because this is the regulatory system and dealing with small drug molecules, easy to mass produce, keep standards and safety and efficacy, not, that's not so true for biomaterials and living organisms and with therapies that are, that are dependent upon that. So and as they go through trying to work through some of these entanglements, it turns out there are lots of other types of intellectual property that have come to the foreground that are more important perhaps in this field than in others that should be considered. And one of the key things you're going to have to really decide is whether you, how, what information you're going to potentially patent or trade secret. And trade secret's considered as a weaker element of intellectual property, but it also doesn't have an expiration date. So provided you, it's carefully guarded and there is a series of, of, of confidentiality me mechanisms that must be put in place in order to achieve trade secret status, but it can be powerful in the sense, like Coca-Cola example, of having that protected so that it will never actually expire. There's also, it's also not as risky for, let's say, you can't be sued for invalidity for a trade secret. Similarly, you'll have something that's, that, ev that everyone in the biotechnology, so when you're dealing with tissue engineering and cell therapies, you know how is incredibly important. If someone has found a way to improve upon a problem, it becomes very useful know-how. Having a business that has a way to capture it, so that it's not helpful if one person figures out how to work out the problem. It must be a way to actually be recorded in the, a paper trail showing that, evidencing it, and then allowing to share it and disseminate it so that everyone can innovate even better and move faster with their work. So having a know-how system where it's capturing and recording it and also deciding what, what you think if it's, you've actually stumbled upon something that's better than anyone else in your, in your field, that that actually could become proprietary, important, confidential know-how. So deciding which, and, 
And I should be very clear that in a patent, you only need to provide the amount of information that enables someone who's skilled in the field to replicate your invention. You do not need to tell them the best possible way to do that. So you can have both a patent and confidential know-how. Another, another area that's often overlooked is the data and biobanks. So in this case, when you're dealing, let's say, if we look at the example of Myriad, they have breast cancer diagnostic um, genetic testing. And they have a, um, basically acquired one of the world's largest repositories for breast cancer tissue. And they actually have held onto that proprietarily and licensed it out for collaboration work for other types of treatments and research. And it's, it is a revenue stream unto itself. And so any kind of biomaterial repository can, be, can, can serve as a revenue um, stream as well. And there's also the, the issue of when you're doing something like a biobank, the UK stem cell bank, you have cells that are being deposited there and they can be, they can be matched to donors. So patient and donor treatments, it can then be used for as a, as a part of the treatment process and it has value there as well with access to it for research and so forth. And I just, explaining and expanding the license portfolio, I think I've touched upon this, where if you can actually collect IP along your entire development R&D chain, the more, the stronger your IP portfolio is gonna be. So all of those are the alternative forms of IP to look to. And then really, I think, the only thing I want to separately suss out here is to sit down a confidentiality issue. And that's because everyone at the beginning wants to well, assume, if they are not already aware of a non-disclosure agreement, NDAs. And businesses have these in order to engage in discussions around general topics. It's not to be, um, it's not a contract you can rely on in place of a material transfer or anything that happens further on with the development or collaboration. That needs a, a separate agreement to address that. But for initial negotiations, NDAs are very important for protecting confidentiality. And without them, you are exposed and vulnerable to actually having destroyed the patentability potentially of any therapy that you're developing. Um, so confidentiality is an essential aspect of, in, of intellectual property. That's, it's, it, the laws of confidence are separate from, from IP. It's not statutory. And it is something that is critical to your business and fundamental to your, to your business plan as well. So what I would say there is part of the toolkit as a, as a healthcare startup is to ha make sure that you have your intellectual property clauses there and structured that, to suit your product and process and what you want, not just grabbed from the internet that says some meaningless dribble, that actually makes sense to you and what you want, that you've actually consulted a, a legal professional for independent advice on it because it's worth it. And you can drop them in and ins insert them into agreements as needed, but you need to have an arsenal of, of intellectual property clauses that help you deal with the ownership issues and with confidentiality and, and the exchange of information uh, between, between any kind of stakeholder in this process. I've mentioned on this slide something that you can look to on your own a bit, but I was just, I've highlighted the issue that scientists do love to discuss in detail what they're doing and what they're researching. And if this is really a commercial, a, a translatable therapy, and, you're, and, and that's the goal, you need to be very clear with employees and researchers about the limits to which they can communicate very clearly. So when they're at a conference, they don't just get to disclose everything. There's certain aspects they must withhold and, it, um, and make sure that they're very clearly aware of it. And if not, it, can, it really can be used against you later in a commercial manner that, that will most likely become quite, quite nasty and will have an impact on your business value. Copyright is another area that's not discussed too much in, in this area, but, that's, but it comes up in, in, in many ways often that it's overlooked and it's a messy area. Um, and that's just a general business commercial pointer is what I'd say, is just to be aware that copyright is, is accrued in your work, but you need to, uh, who owns what, and if that's actually going to be an issue, if copyright plays into anything you're doing, then you need to be very careful of um, where and who is, is creating it and who owns it. Now, last, lastly, I want to kind of get into really why it is that your area, um, intellectual property, is so exciting. But like everything else with the regulatory landscape, the legal landscape is shifting as well. And that is because medicine and healthcare and the life sciences have become so much more exciting and have changed dramatically. Medical technologies, biotechnology have, have, have absolutely revolutionize the way that we are interacting with our healthcare system. And that's, that changes, that now has an impact on every aspect of our life, including our legal system. So how we are dealing with some of these things is a bit in flux. 
And what happens now, unfortunately, biotech patents are currently undergoing a flex on both sides of the Atlantic, particularly in the U.S. And businesses and investors, in particular, don't like uncertainty. Um, so you, in order to deal with these issues and to make sure that you you actually address them appropriately and successfully, you do need to make sure that you are that you have a legal advice that is clearly and carefully drafting on your behalf when they're claiming proprietary rights. So to give you an idea, because there simply isn't enough time for me to go into some of the big legal developments, in the, um, both with genetic sequences, with, with cells, and with diagnostics. But things are, things are at such a point where you need to, what's claimed and how it's claimed, the language that's used, and what can and can't be the legal tests involved are all have all changed and need to be thought through very carefully. So, whenever you're claiming proprietary rights in any kind of living biomaterial, it's raising new questions, often ethical ones, and it needs to be looked at very closely. There needs to be, certainly in the beginning of the field, there were lots of broad proprietary rights. Some people often have heard about these broad genetic patents that were granted. These no longer aren't encouraged and aren't, wouldn't be allowed. It was that the understanding of the science of the time was, wasn't as strong and, and was allowed it to happen then. When recombinant medicine came along, that's when these organisms were allowed to be claimed broadly. So these genetic and cellular, broad genetic and cellular patents aren't happening any longer. The historical position often was, well, if you look at the polio vaccine, you know, can you patent the sun? Meaning a vaccine or, or molecules that are existing in nature surely cannot be patented because they're as they exist in nature. But in actual fact, say in the EU, Things have really changed in how we look at that because it's not that simple. There are a lot of technical processes involved when you're dealing with some of these, these, these molecules. And so came the biotech revolution and the great success story of Genentech. And that recombinant DNA technology, the decision was, and there was, there was a convention to decide whether um, we should be able to actually claim proprietary rights in recombinant DNA organisms and so forth. And that it was found that, that we, we can, and that is fine, but that has had to develop. What does that mean? Where are the limits? And, try, and actually exploring that has cast some new questions into the world, which many of you may have heard of the Myriad case, where we said that human DNA sequences cannot be claimed as a patentable, as patentable subject matter any longer. And that is exactly the kind of a, a situation where it's, that's not surprising because it, it's isolation and the process used to isolate nu the nucleic acid bases. Well, that was new back in the day. That is now commonplace now. It is naturally occurring. It is part of your genetic identity. But it leads to other bigger questions that have still yet to be answered and the knock-on effect as well. If isolating and purification in itself of a material doesn't allow it to be patentable, that could have a huge ramifications for, for bio biotechnology. And I'm not saying that that's where things stand. It certainly don't. In Europe, um, Purification and isolation are patentable subject matter and do make it uh, eligible for patents. Whereas in the U.S., this is being that that this is being um, it's, well, the legal test has been established recently and it has changed, and the, there have and with that comes many questions about what types of um, materials. As they said, it, it's a, it should be something significantly more than what occurs in nature, and so what constitutes something that's significantly different from nature or not. Um, would a, a naturally occurring DNA sequence that has inserted a synthetic, um, a synthetic gene into it, would that then cause that to be, even though it may not affect the function or behavior of that, of that cell, would that actually cause it then to be patentable? Those kind of, lots of questions arise through this. So that's where the question of the biotech patent is at the moment. And it's quite an exciting area. It's very, I could go on about it for a long time, but I won't. And I just wanted to give you a case study example of what it is to look at the patents in an area, especially in a very early developing field, and that's induced pluripotent stem cells. And I've, I've looked into this, this field quite a bit and the proprietary ownership in it, and there was a lot of fear that because these therapies were so promising and had such vast potential uh, therapeutically, that commercially they were, so, they were so interesting that there was a lot of movement into to proprietary and they claim a lot of these um, processes associated with induced pluripotent st stem cells, derivation, and so forth, that this might cause great confusion because there are complex, multi-stage um, processes involved. And so what you need is a bundle of patents, effectively, 
in order to be able to, to have freedom to operate for your therapeutic end product. And many of those processes along the way are what we call platform technologies. They can be used not just with induced pluripotent stem cells, but with lots of different, with other types of stem cells or, or cellular products. And so they have broad application. And if one company were able to lock it up and would it, it, exclusively license it to one other as opposed to freely license it to, um, to lots of others, they could cause there to be a block and to be able to manufacture and, of, of these cell therapies. So there's a lot of concern, and when you look at who's doing what, what you found was a lot of patents were being, um, patent applications were being filed, less have actually been granted, and in actu there, was a, there was a lot of confusion around who owns what. And it was quite international, because there is a biotech cottage industry. It wasn't your typical large pharma and all consolidated under one roof. So there, there have been concerns about the premature privatization. And on the whole, the, that regenerative medicine community and, and, um, and experts in that field have come together to try and tackle this issue and collaborate to overcome. And the way to do that is through intellectual property management. And that's how you license and, and how you can cross-license. There's all kinds of contractual ways these IP mechanisms use to help actually be able to navigate your way through that so that it's not going to deter innovation. Right. And just to give you, that's just a quick breakdown of, there are distinctions between what you can patent, broadly speaking, in the US and Europe, of course. But the key thing for biotech is that actually the focus is still on what can you patent as eligible subject matter, which is really interesting because that's, that's actually considered a threshold question that you usually get that passed quite easily, and then you move on to the more difficult novelty and non-obvious questions. So for you know, a small molecule drug, it, you, know what, you know what chemicals you can and can't patent. It's not, there's not an issue of, of really any kind of objection to whether it's a patentable subject matter. The tests are there. They've been there. It's very solid and certain. That's not the case as I've been expressing to you for biotech patents. And the result has been kind of a ping pong of decisions of, of how guidance is going to be released from the patent authorities versus legal decisions. And things have really changed um, in the U.S. And things have evolved, and there's been all kinds of very particular types of, um, of biomaterials, like human embryonic stem cells. It's had a very ping-pong, green light, red light, go, stop kind of um, passage through in Europe. So it can, as, as years go by, and, these, and these, the interplay between guidance and legal decision becomes complicated. People can become confused. And the concern is that we don't want that to deter people from actually conducting that research and innovation. How am I doing on time? There, just checking. So I'm just going to back that really quickly and just pick up that really where there's a will, there's a way you can patent. That's the bottom line. You know, people will say, oh, software patents, but I'm not sure about that in, in Europe. Well, you can show there is a way if you can show technical effect. It, for the most part, there are different ways to claim proprietary rights. The question is, what kinds of proprietary rights should, should be allowed? And so you want to make sure that you have a whole host of different types of claims um, coming. So whether it's composition of matter or whether it's, it's um, an end product, the actual cell itself, or whether it's a process to culture that cell. So a process. And I, making sure that you kind of cover all that ground is really going to be very important in, in actually securing the intellectual property in this, area, in this area and at this time when it's not always clear that what you hope to be a valid claim will be and will be granted. So just to give you an example of commonly excluded categories would be things like methods of treatment of humans. So a treatment as opposed to something that you administer. So if I put a Band-Aid on someone, that act in the process or the, the process of surgery um, should not, the actual, th that method of treatment is not something that's patentable. Uh, diagnosis practiced on human or animal bodies. So if you're actually you know, performing and listening to the heart and so forth, those acts themselves not patentable. The pre this presentation of information is not patentable. It does have intellectual property. It has copyright, but it doesn't have, it's not a patentable um, asset for me. And then going to very quickly to introduce you, I just wanted to, be, to leave you with a little bit of clarity on why biotech patents are such a hot topic right now and the distinctions between the two main jurisdictions for Europe 
in the US. To give you a quick idea, and just really kind of as a tantalizer to say, look, if I've left the legal authorities and the stories behind, which are great little case stories, behind what's happened in the past five years on both sides of the Atlantic. But it, it, it is very interesting, and it does improve your understanding of if it impacts directly on your technology. I'm more than happy to discuss it on this side. But just to give you an idea, in Europe, they have something called a morality clause. So it's we have statutory authority that says what you can patent and exemptions for what are not patentable categories of, of inventions. And any invention that is considered to be contrary to morality or public order may not be patented. It's one of the exempt categories. And it gives, goes on in Article 2 of that of Article 6, Part 2, to actually give examples of what it considers to be uh, types of inventions that are contrary to morality and public order without actually defining either of those terms. And so things for like processing processes for cloning humans, uh, modifying the germline, which obviously is very uh, topical with the CRISPR uh, technology that's being used for with, with embryo editing, and then the use of human embryos for industrial and commercial purpose. This particular uh, exemption is has actually been highly, highly litigated in Europe because that dealt directly with human embryonic stem cells and how those stem cell lines were derived, which caused embryo destruction in the process. And even though they're doing it for research purposes, ultimately for therapies, which is a commercial purpose, and there, there was a, a legal battle to try um, the, the basically to argue that they should be able to patent those, stem, those human embryonic stem cell therapies that might result. And ultimately now, the, well, I'll come on to it again, it, it is allowed in Europe by way of guidance, and it's, not, and it's not actually written guidance, it's not express guidance through the European Patent Office. And any, any bio, biotechnological invention that is developed after the 10th of January 2008 with a, that involves human embryonic stem cells is patentable. But that date is a cutoff date because before that date, or after that date, um, there is the ability to actually derive human embryonic stem cells without destroying the embryo. So the, there was a capable way of doing it to replicate these inventions without damaging embryos. So that's where that lies now for clarity, because that's something that comes up a bit. It's very niche. All other stem cell patents, so for all the other different types of stem cell patents, are permissible. Um, and the last thing on that list was the human body or any part thereof. So you cannot patent a body part. Going, the, going over to the Atlantic, to the US approach, um, their approach is not to have a statutory list or clarity, and, they, and the argument being, and there's, this is a very contentious topic, but how can a patent authority really determine what is moral or against public order? And should a patent attorney, or should, should a patent examiner really, do they have the technical expertise to do so? How could they transparently and consistently do that? And really, should that be something that's asked of them? So the U.S. has taken a different approach, and they focus on patentable subject matter. And their question comes from three judicial exceptions, and that's laws of nature, natural phenomena, and abstract ideas. And if an invention is a law of nature or a natural phenomena or abstract idea, it is not patentable. And that's, and that's the line of argumentation that they followed for the Myriad case with, ge with genetic patents and all the follow-on sequinum and all the ones that followed to clarify what is and isn't patentable in the U.S. They're focusing on those exceptions and interpretation of it. And in summary, what we have to bring, bring this to close is just that the patent provides the patent owner with exclusive rights, make, use, sell an invention in exchange for publicly disclosing the inventions. So that's your, your basic concept. The thing is that there's only certain types of subject matter that are actually patentable. And that initial threshold is what's really in flux right now, both in the US and with ramifications in Europe as well. So whether that patent will ever get past that threshold to proceed to examination is the big question of uncertainty in the US for biotech patents. And even things like genetic tests for diagnostics has been called into question by, by important um, legal decisions. So things are really a little bit more uncertain in this area. But, and the, and the fight in, in for human embryonic stem cells is decided law now on both, both shores, but surprisingly it's gone in different, different areas. Not as decided any longer for patentability in the US, uh, whereas in Europe it is patentable after January of 2008. So, I just to hurry this along, I'm going to go through. That's a list of the slide that you can refer to. It kind of goes, I didn't put in the legal authorities, the, the, the cases that those 
decisions come from, but it, it is just a summary to kind of as a quick reference for where things are lying in, in the aftermath of some of these big cases and further decisions. And then we come to the conclusion of just a reminder of the key points to summarize everything that I really wanted to drive home, and I think I probably nailed that coffin shut now, but about how you need to think about IP from the beginning, why it's important in determining your core IP assets, the kind of technology you want to, to have. Are you doing a platform technology? Are you planning to, to sell or license it to many? Or are you trying to, to proprietarily own it and develop it fully yourself? All of those things will factor into your business plan. It will deeply impact not only budget, but how you, de how you develop that business plan. And, and your trials, all the regulatory aspects will tie into consideration for your IP as well. It's very, very important. And having a know-how capture system that's recorded and detailed and clear and that everyone is aware of, so having that brainstorm session brings everyone on board and making everyone aware of where, what's in their employment contracts as to confidentiality, making sure you have strong and clear um, non-disclosure agreements and IP assignments and uh, clauses that deal with your IP accordingly in the types of agreements that you're going to need for your business. It's very, very important. It's a basic toolkit to start. It's not something that you're supposed to wait for until you get a little bit bigger, until you have more proof of concept, more trial da data evidence. It really has to start at inception. And with that, I leave you in the good hands to go back to our chair. <laughs> so thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, thank you, McKenna. That was a very detailed and interesting talk. Um, awful lot to think about for people. I think what I'd like to do over the next few minutes is just to put myself in the shoes of uh, those who might be entering our competition, who are early in their entrepreneurial mission, who are just thinking about how they might leverage the value of their perhaps their PhD research, for example, in a commercial setting, um, just by means of example for people who are thinking about entering the competition. And I think what I'd like to do is just go through and pick up some of the points that you mentioned in your talk that I think are worth highlighting and worth uh, perhaps expanding on a little bit, uh, just so people can come away with a slightly clear idea about um, the strategy that they have for how they proceed in their IP needs for their company. So first of all, in um, identifying what it is in their research that can be patented, and in that process of identifying potential IP, I think is crucial in doing your due diligence, as you mentioned, as you say. Um, I think what, what an important part of this identification process is, is to look at the patent databases that are available, see what uh, existing patents there are, and that can not only inform you of the competitive landscape, but help you understand what other people are doing in the industry, what other people are trying, how their methods work, because actually what's an interesting thing about having a patent is that you have to fully disclose what you're doing. So by looking at the patent databases and seeing what patents already exist, that's actually a really good way of seeing how other people are solving the issues that you're facing in various different ways. So. In this theme of identifying uh, what in your research is patentable, how might people really understand what parts of their research are relevant? You talk about manufacturing processes being quite a good target. Um, how can people extract cohesive ideas about what can be patented from a PhD thesis, for example? Holy support that actually looking at the patents in the area it offers a treasure trove of information, effectively, because not only can it help you see how other people have approached the same scientific problems, but the specifications often will walk through the, the history of developments in the field for patents out there. And that can, it can show you what other people and their approaches they've used, which you may or may not agree with. Maybe you've developed something better, but you may not also have to actually disclose that for whatever you're patenting. So that's important to know. So it might give you some kind of competitive advantage that could have later commercial ramifications for your PhD. Um, but whatever you've actually published, you have to be careful. They also can determine what you want to publish in your PhD or allude to and not actually give the detail of. Because if you do publish in your PhD, you won't be able to patent it later. That sort of, that kind of thinking. And it's important. And people will appreciate where you're coming from. It's not withholding science or trying to in any way not be collaborative or help everyone get, get on board. You can get those NDA disclosure agreements and you can sit down with great scientific minds and, and discuss these things with the right measures in place but you don't want to actually lose 
to commercial viability. But more importantly, I think it helps you figure out your research direction as well. Um, it, it, it's, it's an iterative process, really, because sometimes there, you'll see that people are approaching things in a totally different way. Sometimes it may seem completely wacky. It can be from a completely different field, and somehow when you when you go to look, it, it comes up in your search engine. And that, that interdisciplinary kind of cross-pollination often can be very useful as well. Mm -hmm. So I think finding, by looking to patents instead of just looking to the scientific literature when you go to research, I think you're really stripping away down to the commercial aspects of, and when I say commercial, that's not just a greedy profit, profiteering thing. That's actually also a public health aspect to it. They're saying, look, it's one thing to do this in the research lab. It's an entirely another thing to innovate your therapy to get it to patients. How you're going to do that and manufacture on that level or do trials of that size and so forth, if you're posturing this in your PhD, if you're looking, whatever the situation is, often looking to the commercial aspects of, of attempts, failed or otherwise, and knowing who to contact, who to reach out to, and so forth is very helpful in that sense. Okay. I think uh, what you say about publishing your PhD and presenting prior art is something that could potentially be very easily overlooked. Um, people who are doing research at the moment, whether they're postdocs or PhDs, will no doubt be prioritizing generating high quality publications for the sake of, um, of publishing good papers and of getting the grants as the academic culture exists so I think that this is something that is really worth highlighting if you're going to try and patent something you must make sure that you do so before you publish your academic papers and that can be a bit of a conflict of interest for people who are who are academics by nature but are looking towards the commercial domain so I think that's something that would be worth thinking about quite heavily um, I'd quite like to go on to how, uh, how the ownership of IP is in reality for people who are trying to uh, make university spin-outs. I think it can be quite, it, you, you mentioned before that it can be quite difficult in really painting a clear picture about who legally owns the intellectual property. And if you're setting up your IP through a university technology transfer office, which does seem to be the case for most spin-outs, does the university own that IP? Does the researcher own the IP? And if the researcher doesn't own the IP, what kind of access do they have to that intellectual property? Because this is something that you really need to understand properly when you go to write your business plan, because investors will ask, when you're pitching, investors will ask, do you have ownership? What is your ownership status? Do you have exclusive access? You know, can you just talk a, bit, a, bit, a little bit about um, the ownership issue with TTOs and that sort of thing? Sure. So it's, it's a very important point, and it's one that's improving in the UK, but is still sadly not there. But it, technology transfer offices and universities um, are getting better. And the key thing is they're realizing that there is a good, they want their own, their own faculty and students to actually succeed and have commercial ventures. And in order to do that, it doesn't make sense for them to hold back IP or overvalue it. But unfortunately, that often happens. So there are issues there, but who own, the ownership issue is the one that will be immediate when you do a spin out. And it will have to be negotiated then, and it does depend on the university and their policy. So it's not, there's not a blanket answer to that. You, you will actually have to evidence it to investors and so forth to show that, in the, in the case of Cambridge, inventors can own. In the case of Oxford, they may, they may provide a license for use and a very specific whether it be by medical indication or it might be broader, will it be exclusive to them? That exclusivity and of use will be very important for the commercial aspects. These are negotiating points. So if you think you have something that's translatable to patients, so this is going to have a good medical a therapeutic benefit, some kind of technology impact, and you want to take it out and spin it out, you need, the, you need to sit down with your technology transfer and try office and, and actually have independent advice from them in order to, to act in the best interest of your new company. Because the tech transfer office is acting in the best interest of the university. So for them, it's going to be getting whatever royalties and, and so forth and, help, and supporting you. But that's not necessarily in your commercial best interest. And negotiating your, your access is important. The exclusivity aspect or exclusive to what, even if it's narrow and specific to your, to your field, the ability to later on maybe negotiate further so that you can go back and revisit, revisit sort of milestones being able to have um, exclusivity around certain other indications, things like that are all going to be parts of, of negotiations in that agreement that are very, very important. That's interesting. Uh, it's, it's good to see that uh, TTOs are trying to 
really address this issue, but my understanding is that often people do struggle with their relationships with TTOs and that TTOs can um, perhaps sometimes be lacking in how helpful they are. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I think this is uh, something that people often come back to. So I would suggest that you know engaging with your TTO in a really constructive, hands-on way is definitely important to actuating your spin-out. Um, I think having their full support and having good communication with them is really, really vital to making, making your spin-out a success. I think what, another thing that you mentioned that I found quite interesting was the idea that you don't actually have to disclose the best method of doing something in your pattern. If you've done a bit of research that has achieved something and you think, okay, this process is patentable, it was interesting for you to mention that I didn't, wasn't really aware of before that you, know, you can just kind of say approximately what you've done yeah, no, no. or you can say the basics of how you've done it, but you don't actually have to specify the protocol that you used or the exact methodology that you did. So perhaps there could be a way of protecting your um, your technology through trade secrets which complement the patent, right? How does that work? Yeah. So first of all, as I say, I'm not plugging the TTOs as, as the next innovators of, of the UK to, to put them at the, the head. But I think the number one problem, by the way, that comes across is slowness. And, and so there, you know, they're working on a different time schedule, but also everyone involved tends to overvalue the value of their IP. And and, and so that and that's, that's harmful to everyone when you're dealing with inflated IP. So there has to be realistic... Um, valuations, which is difficult to know when you're just a researcher. You don't really, how, how can you kind of price that and have a sense of that? And also trying to really hurry them along. And and I like you said, I was just going to emphasize, in addition to the transfer tech office relationship, which is critical, it's the science communication, which researchers aren't very good at, for them to convey why this might be something which is so obvious to you as a breakthrough in the field, this technology is going to be amazing it may be very technical and not obvious to someone without that technical background. And so that science communication and the relationship you foster there is really important, especially true with your patent attorney and legal advisor. Your legal advisor, to be able to openly discuss and make sure they get it and they're on board with what you're all about. And Because if you don't have that kind of relationship with your legal advisor, you need to get a new one. It has to be a click there because it's, it's, it's actually imperative to how your patent's drafted. Everything about it, it will be a long, a slower, inaccurate process. People have come out with patents claiming inventive steps that actually aren't accurate, and it later destroys their business because they just didn't feel like they could go back to their patent attorney and kind of things, or, or they didn't even, or sometimes in the case of researchers, they aren't able to communicate it as well. So you need someone who really, can really delve in and, and run with it. It just depends. So anyway, that relationship I wanted to emphasize. Separate to that, I was going to, um, your, I think that your point about being able to withhold information. I want to be clear, I'm not saying that you know you aren't trying to further science and progress of mankind, but there is a commercial aspect to this, and it's absolutely true, and it's very important that you know. You do not have to give the best protocol. You have to give the protocol that works so someone can replicate and get, this, and get the results that you're claiming your technology is capable of, but it doesn't have to be the best one, and I would argue it shouldn't be. I mean, that's a public record document. Why would you just give away your, your competitive edge? It's absurd. So, I mean, and, no one and that's not going to help anyone because part of that privatization process and research and investment is, is all part of the engine that pushes progress forward. So I actually think that the, you, know, you should be very careful and think carefully about what have other people said have been done. It may be really obvious to you, but it wasn't obvious to them. So maybe you don't have to give all the tricks away. And they can become incredibly important know-how or a trade secret, but usually it's going to be, that's going to be confidential know-how. We've had a question from uh, one of our audience members who wants to know... <laughs> he wants to know uh, where, what are the rights of the inventor of a patent and I suppose this would be around um, the ownership issue and the rights that are associated if you're the listed as the inventor of a patent that, does that give you automatically give you access to leverage that patent or do you have to actually make an agreement further to being listed as the inventor with the owner to have that kind of um, that kind of freedom to operate Right, so I'm going to answer this mainly focusing on the UK um, and Europe in that sense. So just to be clear, here in Europe, uh, as the inventor, you most likely don't have access, don't have rights to those to that patent, because you ultimately are probably, especially in the case of biotechnology, it's not something you normally do in your garage, your garage, as you say, <laughs> but it's it's something. So you're more likely to be an employee. Or there are other natures. You could be a PhD student. You could be an intern. There are all kinds of, of iffy situations where you have to look to the policy of the institute that you're working with. But for the most part, um, generally speaking, patents will be considered the ownership of the employer by statute. 
um, and there, that, there will be a signed over from you listed as an inventor to the employer institution. You'll sign rights now. In the U.S., that is not a given, um, and it's it, in the sense that it's it's an assignment that, that takes place, and it's a very important aspect, and it can be a negotiating chip. It doesn't mean that you can't be paid to do your assignment, or and so forth. There are there are ways to negotiate that, but bear in mind it's very much going to depend on your employment contract or whatever um, contractual arrangement you have with that institution that you've where you've performed the research. But for the most part, the inventor who is c that conducted the research and developed the breakthrough, really that, that is done in the course of employment or, or in the contractual relationship and subject to the terms of that contractual relationship. Um, and that's what's going to determine who owns what. Most institutions will be switched on to, to, to claiming the rights to that work. So any kind of assignment, and if you want to then as the inventor spin out, it will be, a, it will be a, an assignment or a license that they're providing. Okay, okay, that's good. Um, I think one last one thing that I want to talk about, I know we've gone pretty far over time, but <laughs> um, there's a lot to talk about. I think one more thing would be it can take a surprisingly long amount of time to get all this stuff sorted out, right? It takes like a year between your filing date and priority date. Um, if people want to really make this thing, make their technology work, you know, if they, if they haven't filed IP now, then it's going to be a little bit too late by the time they get into the competition finals. So, you know, if you haven't got your IP done, that's fine. You just have to say in your business plan, we're in the process of doing it. How long can it take to get all this stuff sorted out? Like, the design process itself must take a long time, right? That's fair. I can, I, I can give some advice on this. So something I didn't bother to go into because of time was that if you have a priority filing, that's you filing your invention and supporting it just enough. And then you have 12 months before you have an actual filing date for your patent application. And that's when you, when, in, during that year time, you can work on shaping and changing your claims and the scope and, and the evidence and, and so forth that you're actually going to officially file 12 months later. Now, well, priority filing is quite cheap in the UK. So this is, this is specific, and, you know. But it's you know it's it's, it's very it's in about two hundred pounds it's not it's not expensive in that sense. A, month, a year later, you are not ready to file your patent. It's often the case, so you abandon. I mean, so you you therefore withdraw. You're not going to you're not going to pursue your filing. When you do that, effectively, you're you cannot ever claim back to your priority date. You lose being able to claim that you came up with this invention, you developed this as of this early priority date. You lose the ability to do that, so it drops away. So you've lost the protection for that period. But you do have the ability to say, well, I'm not quite ready, let me drop it away and let me put another provi provisional priority document in. And then wait and hope in 12 months further out that you will be able to. So you're constantly at least trying to get the earliest priority date you can possibly get and, and protecting it in the meantime. So you could drop away, then, then put in another priority document. 12 months later, are you ready to file your application and go along that way? So at least you're offering as a startup, as an entrepreneur, saying, hey, I've, I've, I provisionally put in my priority filing on this. So I'm, I'm thinking about IP strategy. I'm serious about it. And I'm doing the best I can. And, and it's, it's obviously not going to cost it, it, much in that early stage. And take it from there. So that's obviously a good way to go about it. So having the priority date is the key part of this and having a priority date given is a demonstration that you've designed your pattern already or is there a lot of design process that goes on between the priority date and the filing date what's going to be required is very much I it's very much going to depend on what you're what we're talking about here i mean i don't what kind of process i need to know what the invention is that, that really you're claiming and how much evidence you're going to need to support to, to have that be but the the threshold's low for a priority filing. It's not obviously that for the versus the filing that you need. It can't be fanciful. I mean, if, it, if it's just an idea that you've plucked from the sky, and there's nothing to support that this is that this is actually can be replicated. It, that it's been it has utility and so forth. You know, you have to be able to show that this is this has foundation. So there is. I mean, it, it's in there. And I again, if, without knowing the specifics, it's hard to advise in that regard. But the point is that it doesn't by any means need to be as well-baked as it does 12 months down the line when you go for a filing. And the point about the priority date, by the way, is just that in case anyone else is doing the same thing in similar research, if they end up filing or, or entering a priority date before yours, 
then then your patentability is squashed. So it's, it's all about the prior art or certain aspects. Let's say you have a few novel aspects you want to claim and you lose out on a couple of them because someone else has filed, has done a priority filing earlier than you. So prior art and then went on to file and they have an application in the process. So, I mean, the whole prior art day is about, is about competition of who's getting to the invention first in that sense. But if it's a, if it's a choice between that and doing nothing, and you have some, it's, you know, it's all kind of a little bit up in the air, but you have 12 months to shape it and form it, that it's probably a more, a pro, it, it, would, it shows at least an effort there, I think. Okay, good, good. Lots to think about for people there. Um, I think we should probably wrap up because it's, we've been going on far too long, but... <laughs> <laughs> what are you saying, Ollie? <laughs> <laughs> but um, we don't want to take up everybody's very precious time. But uh, I hope there's been some really interesting things for you guys to think about there. I think it's really important to highlight that IP isn't this massive intimidating thing that is quite hard to wrap your head around. Although there is a lot of nuance to it when you really get into the bones of it. I think for somebody who's just trying to start up at the point that perhaps you might be um, getting your priority date, uh, getting your priority date filed, having a bit of a think about what you might cover in your patenting, how you might protect your technology, which areas of your product or your manufacturing process you might want to patent, these are some of the things that you can start to think about. And making sure that you've processed these ideas when it comes to pitching is going to be a really important element of doing a good job in your pitch. So, you know, if you're talking to investors, they want to know that you've thought this stuff through. They want to know that the patent that you've got is of good quality. And even if you haven't gone through and you've got everything filed, if you've got a priority date, that would be great. If not, you can just say, okay, we haven't got IP yet, but you know, this is what we're going to do it on. This is how we're going to go through it. Nobody else has got it. Um, so just being able to, uh, to, to communicate some cohesive ideas about your IP strategy will be a good place to start. So thank you, McKenna. Um, if you want to know more about the competition and you're still trying to decide what to do, there's a, you can find us at temisbpc.org. If you have specific questions, please email us at info at temisbpc. We're also on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, you can't avoid us if you search the right things. So by all means, look us up. And thank you very much for listening. Uh, I hope it's been interesting. And we'll see you again for the next, uh, the next PAP session, which will be on finance and investment, um, which we'll hear a lot more about, uh, about getting investment. So... Thank you again. Um, I'm going to close the webinar now and please get in touch. Thank you very much.